congenital, <clears throat> which just means um, they have grown up and they still have their heart condition they were born with. And our children's hospital cardiology clinic is still seeing those patients through adulthood, um, which means our exercise lab continues to see them now, even when they get older. Um, and we also have expanded into pediatric and adult congenital cardiac rehab. Um, and about three years ago, I got promoted to be the supervisor of that entire lab team. So there's about six of us um, and everyone on our team does the exercise testing and the cardiac rehab for all of our patients. All right. I'm uh, Jamal Ozumek. I'm the current president of uh, CEPA. I'm also a clinical associate professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where I serve as the director of our cardiac rehab program, as well as director of our uh, professional doctor in clinical exercise physiology program, which is the first of its kind uh, in the nation, and happy to talk uh, more about that during today's panel. Thanks, Jamal. Um, and my name is Laura Richardson. I am a clinical associate professor in the School of Kinesiology at the University of Michigan. Prior to Michigan, I, like many of you, was um, in the state of Ohio. So I worked for many years in Akron in both cardiopulmonary rehab and um, with diabetes, and then really the last, gosh, 17, 18 years in bariatrics um, with obesity and pre and post um, gastric bypass surgery and all that good stuff, and have been involved in CPA. I'm the immediate past president for quite some years, and we're excited to share the profession, what we've learned, and answer questions with all of you. So um, do you want to learn, do you want us to just go through? Jamal, we'll let you maybe give a little more background. Sure. Uh, background of what I do. Yeah. That sounds great, yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess the way I like to start with these types of discussions is kind of me sitting in your seats way back when. And I originally got excited about clinical exercise physiology um, when I was taking a clinical cardiovascular class. And that really got me motivated to learn more about how we can employ exercise to help improve just general cardiovascular health, but especially those individuals that have high risk factors for developing cardiac disease and those individuals that have been diagnosed with cardiac disease and have had major life altering events. Um, this was really reinforced when I was uh, running in a 5K and I unfortunately witnessed an individual have a cardiac arrest and someone who was, looked like they were um, really turning things around and getting into an active lifestyle. And at that age, you know, I think you're pretty much indestructible and exercise is certainly safe, but it was kind of eye-opening to, to understand that there are probably some techniques and some ways that we can safely implement exercise and, and do it effectively in, in these populations. So that uh, really kind of got piqued my interest. So I decided to do my master's degree in clinical exercise physiology. That was at Wake Forest University. Um, and then from there, really got the, the uh, I guess, the bug in interest in looking into research a little bit more in clinical populations, as well as continuing my clinical work in, in cardiac rehab and other settings. Um, so I decided to pursue my PhD, which allowed me to do additional research, dive a little bit deeper into how we can use exercise and physical activity to improve overall health and stay active within the hospital setting. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get into Ball State's program in Muncie, Indiana, where I was able to do both uh, research as well as clinical work. And um, at that time, really was enjoying both. So I, I wanted to continue on and, and build some of my skills in that area and decided to do a postdoctoral fellowship, which took me out to um, Denver, Colorado for a couple of years. And that was in a position that was pure research. And I was doing just some phenomenal work with some incredible investigators and research staff and understanding how physical activity and exercise impacts cardiovascular health across the menopause transition. And this was pure research, just writing grants and writing papers. And it took me out of the clinic. And I realized that was just one thing that I was missing, just the clinical application of exercise physiology in populations 
that are probably most deserving of, of that lifestyle change. And that drew me back to looking at positions that allowed me to do both. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to, to see a, a job posting at UIC where I was asked and tasked to develop a cardiac rehab program within our department's faculty practice where we're able to teach, mentor, do research, but actually provide clinical services to patients that are coming from across the street at our hospital. And so I've been doing that for the past um, seven years and have really been enjoying it. Um, I actually work in a physical therapy department at UIC, even though I have no formal training in physical therapy or have never taken a physical therapy class um, ever in my life. The department head is just someone who really appreciates multidisciplinary practice. So I've, I was able to get onto that um, department and work with some brilliant individuals and see what it looks like to go through a rigorous clinical program, such as the DPT program. And that really sparked my interest in growing educational opportunities for individuals who are interested in clinical exercise physiology beyond the master's level but don't necessarily want to do a PhD. Um, the PhD process is certainly rigorous and you're in the lab and you're taking multiple classes and it is, it, it's quite a, quite a task and you better enjoy conducting research if you want to do it, but many individuals don't have interest in them. That's perfectly okay. Um, so I spoke to my department head and proposed the idea of developing a similar model as a professional doctorate in other professions and uh, to do it specifically in clinical exercise physiology. And fortunately enough, he's as crazy as I am, and he agreed to the idea, and we were able to put together a proposal, get that passed by a university in the University of Illinois um, system. And so we were able to start our first cohort this, this fall in the Professional Doctor of Clinical Exercise Physiology, which is one year extension above the master's program, um, teaches additional skills for clinical exercise physiologists, specifically learning how to uh, provide diabetes education and become certified diabetes care and education specialists, which CEPs can become once they hold ACSM's clinical exercise physiology certification. We also have additional courses that prepare students to provide efficacious exercise interventions and exercise testing to chronic, uh, to, to populations with chronic conditions that we're normally not faced with in, in typical cardiac rehab settings. So individuals that are actively going through cancer treatment, those that, that are end stage renal disease, um, individuals that have long COVID. So we're starting to see that in our exercise clinic and have created special specific opportunities for our students to provide exercise interventions and other lifestyle modifications to those with long COVID. Um, in addition to developing skills to become cardiovascular sonographers, be able to image the heart and other vasculature, and uh, learn some of the foundational skills of becoming an effective manager and leader within clinical institutions and being able to um, uh, design effective clinical programs and ensure their financial stability over multiple years. And so, so far, our cohort has been um, enjoying their experiences as, as we have as well. And we're looking forward to accepting applications at the, the, um, in the middle of February for next year's cohort. So happy to answer any questions towards the end, but I'll allow Sandy and, and Laura to fill in any more information about their, their specific paths. Laura, you go. You want me to go? Okay. So um, I, a little different than Jamal, I worked most of my career with my master's degree. So like many of you sitting here um, getting your graduate degree right out of my master's, I had done an internship and um, was a little skeptical that, you know, working with geriatrics was really my calling. I, um, my focus was being a ballerina and I'd spend most of my time with really healthy people, but I needed an internship. So I, um, gave uh, the cardiology department a, a shot and fell in love. Um, so I 
quickly right after my master's got a full-time job working in cardiopulmonary rehab. And I also um, got this great experience under our medical director to do a lot of research. Back then, um, our computer skills, I don't, not that old, but old enough to tell you that it was um, paper charting. So I, um, we wrote a really robust paper a long time ago on 10 years trends of cardiac rehab, which is still crazily cited today, all these years later. But um, so I got to learn about the growth of cardiac rehab kind of from its beginning and, and understand the value in therapeutic exercise. So I worked quite some time um, really close in both phase one and phase two cardiac rehab, um, did a lot of diabetes education um, for newly diagnosed people and just basic hospital work, just as an exercise physiologist in a clinic with adults with chronic disease, um, loved it. And then went back and got my PhD um, and in that process ended up in a bariatric clinic. And I'll share with you, my journey into bariatrics was again at the cusp of really all of this beginning. It used to be that um, the surgeons were doing bariatric surgery just out of general surgery. Like we didn't have these obesity clinics like we have now. And it was all very um, new. It wasn't in any of the textbooks I had read about gastric bypass surgery. So, um, you know, the last 20 years of learning the growth of how we treat obesity parallels a lot of where, where I was when I was in your shoes um, as a young graduate student with learning about chronic disease and how I fit into the paradigm of the healthcare system and work closely with physicians and psychologists and nurses. So I love what I was doing and kind of by de facto ended up starting to teach at a university. And here I am now um, helping mentor other students to come through this pathway. So um, like I said, I mean, I did most of my work with my master's um, and I did get an ACSM certification. Um, it was the old RCEP exam I took um, back then and um, have really been dedicated to the field and helped thousands of patients reach goals. And I've learned a lot being so close to physicians not obviously going to medical school and having a big learning curve for a lot of pharmacology and really understanding a lot of the things that we don't have in our exercise physiology textbooks has been um, just an opportunity for lots of growth. I mean, I feel like as an exercise physiologist in a clinic, you're always learning um, and reciprocally always helping other people value how movement needs to be a part of everyday practice. So um, yet my journey kind of similar with patient care with Jamal, but I was working most of the time with just a master's degree and um, did, learned a lot. And, um, you know, again, ended up in a field that I never thought that it would be my calling to be working with people in secondary prevention um, who were a lot of times non-compliant in the beginning. So that, that was always a challenge and, and great fun. So that's who I am as a clinician, Sandy. Okay. Okay. Well, so I'm kind of the um, crazy case study and how far you can go without your PhD. Um, I don't have my PhD. I don't have plans to get my PhD. Um, but I, I was one of those 25 years ago that was um, started undergrad as I'm going to PT school. And I think by the time that became clear that that wasn't going to happen for me, um, I was a little late in the game. So I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with a four-year degree in exercise physiology. Um, I remember doing an internship in cardiac rehab um, sort of at the last minute and thinking, I don't even like old people, but I didn't really know a lot of them either. So like, that wasn't fair for me to say. Um, and I completed that, um, 500 hour internship that spring before I graduated. And I just, I fell in love with all those people. I mean, within just a couple of weeks, it felt like I had about 80 new, um, grandparents. Um, and I went to a, through a bit, pretty big cardiac rehab program. They're not all that big, but the one I did was, and it was about 20 patients every hour um, on the days I was there. So I graduate, I move home. I live in Podunk, Indiana. Um, I start looking for jobs in either Cincinnati or Indianapolis. I'm thinking cardiac rehab. Um, and then I quickly realized that 25 years ago, a lot of cardiac rehab facilities were still hiring nurses. Um, they really were. They, I don't know if that was just geographically where I lived or that was just where we were at the time. Um, so I started sending out applications and I ended up getting the job at Children's Hospital. Um, I applied to be an EKG tech, which is a little bit below a four-year degree even, um, but I didn't even know they had an exercise physiology lab. And so when my boss 
um, called and said, we have this lab, are you interested? And I remember thinking, I don't even like kids, you know, cause now I'm all, all my, I'm hooked. I love old people. And I, but you know, I was desperate and my um, lone little Bible had already come in with my payment stub. So I took the job and I'll probably never leave. I've been there almost 25 years. Um, I love kids just as much as I did the first day. I love patient care just as much as I did the first day. And now that we're doing older adults with exercise and rehab, um, I love that part of it too. So um, I, I've stayed at the same job, so I don't have a lot of good advice about switching jobs and changing jobs and stuff like that. Um, my advice would be, um, you don't have to love the way it sounds when you jump in, just jump in. Um, if, it, if it has some aspects you think, you would like about an entry job or you have things to learn, um, you have things to learn. Everyone has things to learn. So if you don't know EKG and the job's going to um, require that, jump in. If it's more education and you don't have a lot of experience with that, jump in. Um, because in the last 25 years, I've learned a lot. I've taken some certification exams. Um, I'm now in charge of the internship program. So I'm turning around teaching people in your um, shoes that are doing internships, teaching them to love kids and adults and testing and rehab. Um, I've gotten involved with SEPA and some other national organizations, and I love that part of it just as much too. So um, I would just say, don't be afraid of the unknown. Just um, you have a lot to learn, especially as an entry level person, uh, just starting in our field and um, get out there and prove yourself and work hard and don't complain because you have lots to learn. Um, yeah, that's me. Anyone have specific questions you want us to direct? We, we, ha we have lots to share, but any questions you want to ask us to help direct the conversations? Day-to-day -day routine. Um, we have a question. What is your day-to-day -day routine like in the clinic? Thank do you, you want to ask? Do you want to ask those to like specific people, just so we don't talk or like? Sandy, you want to go? Just tell them what your day in the life is like. Yeah. So when I was part of the team and not as much just leading and managing the team, um, I was boots on the ground every day. Um, our cardiology clinic is very busy. Um, we have multiple cardiologists in clinic every single day, and our exercise lab caters to all of those um, physicians. So. We have about eight exercise slots every hour of the day, um, all five days of the week. And um, some days are certainly busier than others, uh, where we know like we're going to get hammered on Thursdays, but Wednesdays are a little bit slower. Um, we also, are, my team does cardiac rehab. So instead of just a one-time exercise test and you're done for the year, uh, the cardiac rehab patients, just like the um, old people model where you show up three times a week or only twice a week and you have about an hour's worth of exercise, we follow that model. Uh, we just tend to do our patients one-on-one -on -one with the exercise physiologist because we get a lot of like um, eight, nine, 10, 12 year olds, you know, they're either waiting for a transplant, they just got a transplant, um, or sometimes they're young adults that are going to school and working and then come in for cardiac rehab, but uh, we treat them a little more with kid, kid gloves because we don't expect that they you know, an old person, you can bring them in and be like, treadmill, this is go, this is stop, and don't go very fast. Um, but we're trying to teach them how to work all of our equipment, and they don't have that experience. Um, they probably didn't play sports in high school, or some of them aren't even allowed to play PE because um, their health is just too dicey. So we, we just really work with them with kid gloves and kind of teach them different exercises, and uh, we're kind of right there with them. We would like to do more of a group setting because just like old people, you know, those old men, they show up to cardiac rehab because there's other old men there and a couple old ladies. Um, we, we know that the um, kids being in the same room together out of their hospital room would be good. We were um, right to the point of that um, right before COVID started. We had a little girl that was about seven and a little boy that was about four and they were staying in our hospital at the same time. They got transplanted around the same time and they basically, when they started floating the idea of cardiac rehab. They said, well, we'll come, but we're only coming together. And we thought, okay, cool. We'll do that. We'll do you guys together. So we'd bring them over and they'd play and work out at the same time. Um, 
We Our hospital also has lots of outpatient um, clinics and satellites. If you know anything about Cincinnati Children's Hospital, we are taking over the world. We're, we're infiltrating Ohio. We're infiltrating, I live in Indiana, and we're all the way up into Indianapolis and the, the outlying um, uh, communities. Um, and then we've taken over a bunch of things in Kentucky. So right now we have an exercise lab at Louisville and E-Town. So I just spent the day there today, uh, just a big long car commute to run a couple exercise tests and come back. Um, but we're hoping to grow that clinic. I bet in the next couple of years, we'll be up towards Indianapolis with exercise testing um, and over and some other places in Ohio. Right now we just send our doctor, EKG tech and sonographer. So it's, it's pretty much boots on the ground, working with patients all day long. Right. And then just so I get a good understanding of everyone's experience, please raise your hand. Uh, and then those on the Zoom call, just do the, the virtual hand raise. Um, if you have had any rotations or internships in cardiac rehab. Okay, so not a ton. All right, so essentially in, in cardiac rehab, um, so we, we operate in a very similar manner. We have our exercise sessions Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we are a relatively smaller program, so we can only see six patients per hour. And the patients that commonly come and, and see with us and, and work with us are those that qualify for cardiac rehab through what insurance essentially allows. So individuals that have had either a heart attack Stents put in, uh, a cabbage, so coronary artery bypass graft, heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, um, individuals that uh, have had, in our, not in our program, but in general, if they've had a heart transplant or a heart and lung transplant can do cardiac rehab. And then individuals that have stable angina. So it's very predictable when they're gonna have symptoms of coronary ischemia. And then individuals that have either had a valvular repair or a replacement. So patients with those diagnoses will have either full or partial coverage from their insurance to do a 36 session um, cardiac rehab program. And so similarly, at the Sandy, our sessions are one hour long. And one of the benefits of having a relatively smaller program is that we're going to be able to provide much more individualized and custom exercise prescriptions and care. So many institutions, because they're able to see very large volumes, the big focus is, is on aerobic exercise, whether it's on a treadmill, a bike, or a recumbent stepper, and maybe a little bit of time left at the end. But through a lot of the research that we do and a lot of the research that we read in experts across our field, we know that there's a pretty large population of individuals that are much older, that are frail, and that are very high risk for falls. So commonly in, in larger programs, because they just don't have the staff ratio, these patients tend to get put on recumbent steppers where it's very safe, but it may not be the most effective in preventing falls in the future. So what we're able to do is in our sessions, identify those individuals that truly would require far more attention rather than putting them on an aerobic device for 10, 15, 20 minutes and then switching to another one. We're able to customize their, their exercise program by incorporating strength training, balance and agility exercises to really focus on the main limiting factor that they're faced with clinically. And so the biggest way that we understand who should receive these types of customized trainings, well, everyone's receiving a customized exercise prescription, but receiving additional uh, care is through our orientation visits. And a lot of the time that we spend reviewing medical records and notes within our medical record system, and that's done on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So that's a lot of our kind of research investigative days with some of our patients. And during those orientation visits, you're not only getting a good understanding of what their previous medical history is, but understanding just through them and through uh, interviews, what their major limiting factor is, what they would like to be able to do. Many of these individuals have a very difficult time just getting out of their chair, walking across the room to be able to get a cup of water and to go back down to where they were sitting. So a lot of things that we take for granted these patients are facing difficulties throughout the day and are not really able to do what they would like to do. 
Um, and when we realize these limitations, these barriers, we do a few additional um, functional tests to see what their balance is like, to see what their fitness is like. And we incorporate the outcomes from those tests in the exercise prescription and the progression of their cardiac rehab program. So it starts to look a little bit more like, um, you know, high-end clinical personal training, physical therapy, um, but essentially by clinical exercise physiologists. Because a lot of our staff, well, everyone on my staff, understands how to customize that exercise prescription to be able to get at the main limiting factor for that patient. And so through that, that really makes our job a lot more interesting, in my opinion, um, and really enjoyable because you really are able to focus on the individual. Whereas again, in some of these much larger programs, it turns into group exercise. And understandably, it's easy to lose sight of the individual service that these patients should be receiving. Um, and so that, that really makes, I think, my experience as a clinical exercise physiologist and being involved in each one of these steps in our program really exciting and really um, worthwhile and rewarding is to be able to see that an individual who had a really difficult time just going from the waiting room into our cardiac rehab space is now able to go and get groceries, is able to go to the shop and just do whatever the heck that we typically do without even thinking about it with freedom. And so really at the end of the day with these patients that are able to stick with us throughout the entire way and put in a great effort, they get their lives back for the most part, no exaggeration. They're really able to do whatever they would like to do, get their independence. Um, and that's probably the most rewarding thing I get from working in as a clinical exercise physiologist in the field is to be able to see that true and honest appreciation for what they're getting out of the services that clinical exercise physiologists provide. Because um, really for us, again, it's, it's something that is day in and day out and having those moments where you can really make a difference in someone's life um, is just it makes it makes it all worth it at the end. I'll share. Um, we have a few slides, and I'll share a little bit about bariatrics. Um, so we, I know we don't have lots of time left, but I, I want to share a little bit just to give you a little more background as stuff that you're learning. Obviously, all of us are affiliated with. Um, CEPA, who is a um, small organization within ACSM. And, you know, we serve to help uh, promote the profession. Um, we're in more than just cardiac rehab, but that was our home and our beginning back in the 80s through the 90s is most CEPs um, were in cardiac rehab, but really looking at how we can grow and um, really develop a, a big network. As you heard, all of us three of us here, we are all certified. Um, most hospitals may hire you without the certification and ask you to get it within a certain amount of time after being hired. So I hope that some of you are beginning to think about this. Um, so once you're ready to go do an internship and collect your hours, this is a heavily sought after, it really shows at documentary skills and abilities to get a job, whether it's oncology um, and, and exercise, cardiac, pulmonary, any of these things, most of your classes you're taking, I'm sure, are giving you some of those key domains and objectives to be able to pass the ACSM CEP exam. Um, you know, again, I started in cardiac rehab, but then moved to bariatrics and bariatric looks different in many hospitals as cardiac rehab looks different. So a lot of times it's individualized one-on-one, -on -one, a little bit like pediatrics, um, helping a patient make behavior change before they get the surgery, which is required by our insurance companies for obesity interventions, and then following up after the surgery. Um, we have a lot of colleagues um, that work in oncology with cancer and rehab. Um, as Jamal mentioned in his program, there's a big need for diabetes, um, with diabetes education and being certified with metabolic. Um, so, you know, there are, the field is big. Um, you may have seen this photo, but this shows many of the skills that we do, which is really monitoring physiological hemodynamics when someone's exercising, um, doing a lot of behavioral counseling, setting goals, helping with behavior change and adopting many new skills that not everyone innately had before they had their um, intervention or their diagnosis. So there's a lot of communication and um, being able to customize and individualize what we're doing. So it's really not a, a cut disease, like or a straight path. There's so many different 
um, realms within a clinic that someone can work. So hopefully, you know, these are just a few of our slides. I, um, we, as a community of practicing professionals, um, researchers, uh, professors, again, that's what CEPA does. It helps us to get information in our journal, within our meetings and our webinars to stay current in the field. So what you see here on the slide is our upcoming conference. Um, at the conference, if you're a member, it's $15 to be a member. You get a lot for your student member, but you can attend for free. So if you've never attended a professional conference, this might be the one that you may want to um, hop on. It's virtual, which is great. And these five names, you need to Google them and read about them. You need to pull up their articles. They are heavy hitters in the field. So I have um, lots and lots of fabulous things. Each one of these names has um, just an incredible track record with how as an exercise physiologist in different realms, they have succeeded significantly. So not only are they wise and brilliant, but they're really great speakers as well. So a, a giant plug for these as you're in our field to kind of know some of our big names that all of us look up to. Um, I, I think that's an important thing. So if you've got an assignment or something in class, pick one of these guys to do it on. And then we have a journal. Um, so as a member, you get free access to our journal. And I always tell my own students, it's really hard when the professor says, go find a research journal and you get this journal and it's so dry and heavy. So if you're looking for um, publications that are directly linked to exercise physiology, um, it exists. So, you know, I'm kind of speaking fast because I know we're going to hop off here. Um, and we're, we work a lot with um, other countries. So Australia, ESSA, the Canadians, um, bases in the middle is um, the, the UK and Britain. Um, so I just kind of wanted to share those to kind of give you a visual of some of the big things. Um, so Jenna, we only have a few minutes, but so I don't want to keep talking and I talk super fast, but um, go ahead no, and jump in. Fine. If we get kicked off, we can, we should just be able to um, go back on to the same link and password if I don't want to like cut anybody short at all. Um, yeah, no, that's great. So yeah, I guess I'm, I'm of course wanting to know, does, is anyone sitting there with thinking they have a question that, or you can type it if you're online here. Did someone's hand go up? Um, I had a quick question for Sandy, actually. You said that you um, worked with both like um, older, the older adults and then you went to pediatrics. I was wondering how that change in working from two different, like really different populations was. Yeah, it was a, it was a big change for someone like me um, because I started at Children's after college. Um, so we did kids, we don't do newborns and obviously toddlers, you have to be like five or six, old enough to cooperate with an exercise test. If you're not big enough for the bicycle, we do treadmill. Um, sometimes just bring, we have had some two and three and four year olds. You can imagine that went as terrible as it sounds. Obviously we're not going for max VO2 um, on those young kids. Maybe it's just the EKG stickers to see if they have arrhythmia or um, get the pulse oximeter on their forehead to see if they desat with exercise. Um, usually bringing them in the lab getting some of the equipment on them, they're already screaming and crying. And so you can see if their heart's doing anything funny. Um, I, I thought it was a big change because in the beginning, um, we would only exercise patients, even as our part of our pediatric clinics, um, some of our doctors would see patients till your age, till you're through college, see where you lay in with a job. And then if that's still in Cincinnati, we'll, we'll float you to an adult cardiologist. So we were exercising people up to about 30 years old in the beginning, and we thought that was old. Um, and then when we started our adult congenital program, it was automatically 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70-year-olds. So for someone like me that had 15 years um, under my belt with peds, you know, all of a sudden to have some big, uh, hairy, chested, 50-year-old man, and he's saying he has chest pain, well, yikes, like, go to an adult facility. Or you would ask a question like um, something about his pacemaker or ICD, like when was the last time that went off? And, you know, for kids, it was like, well, at gym and well here and adults, you might get a whole history about that romantic night they had with their spouse or something like, I don't need to know, like, I don't know how to handle that. I don't know what to say. Um, so it was a big change for someone like me. Now, uh, most of our team that's younger, that's come in in the last couple of years, they don't know any different. They'll take care of a kid. And then the next test will be an older adult and then another kid, a couple more kids and then an older adult. But it was a change. Um, we're kind of taught into the door. Don't just treat a child like a small adult. 
And then but basically within like two months time, it was like, and these old people are coming to you. So you just had to go with it. Thank you. Um, I don't, we might be kicked off if we do in the middle of a question. I just want to say thank you so much for coming. But um, before that, does anyone have any questions? All right, well, I guess we just used up all the time we possibly could. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. That was um, really insightful. Anyone wants to take a round of applause?